What do you do when a spouse or a loved one no longer recognizes you? You begin to get frustrated. You feel lost. You feel helpless. You begin to get worn down to a point of not being able to take care of yourself or your loved one. How can you gain the skills not only to take care of your loved one, but you? Today on Baby Boomer University, we have a very special guest, Jill Gaffner Livingston of Global Training Experts. Jill will give us insight to this deadly disease and guide us to solutions that will better equip us to deal. I'm your host, Rich Sparks, and let's welcome Jill Gaffner. Hi, this is Rich Sparks, and class is in session. So if you have not been affected by someone with dementia, you will be. Looking at some of the national stats here, over 16.1 million Americans and this is just for Alzheimer's or other dementias. Even as far as if you're just a Trekkie, if your favorite person on that was Lieutenant Ruha, I think you pronounce it, she was the communications person, <laughs> but she's now affected with dementia. Um, funny enough, just this last Tuesday, one of my uh, oldest and dearest friends just sent me a text that a person she was working with just passed from Alzheimer's. But we are so lucky to have this awesome guest, Jill Gaffner Livingston, and she authored Personal Positioning for the Caregivers. And just welcome aboard. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Excellent. Thanks for coming to class. So, Jill, if you wouldn't mind, tell us a little bit about yourself. And this seems to be a real passion of yours. How did yeah, you get into sure this? Is. Well, you know, it, it's funny. When you look back, that that's a loaded question. How did you get into this? Sure. Right? <laughs> because when we're younger, we have all these these ideas of what we want to become and what we're going to do, and, and the fairy tales uh, go on. But uh, then there's another path that you take, and that's the, the one that you're given. So in a, I'll make it a, a five-minute. My, uh, my life started out, you know, or my adult life started out. I, I was married young at 22. Nine years in with two kids, my, uh, my husband, Bob, was diagnosed with double lung cancer mm. and then brain cancer. His life expectancy at that time was uh, 12 months. Wow. But uh, there was a doctor that went in and performed an experimental surgery to take the brain tumor out. And um, it was to provide Bob for perhaps a, a few more months, which he was more than willing to do, right? Sure. Uh, the thing was, it was an experiment. So it, we weren't really sure what was coming from, from that. Eventually, his head was... Uh, infected and mm. it started decaying we had a skull removed and that launched a series of strokes and seizures and then early onset wow. dementia so when we say oh, how'd you get into this well it was kind right. of god put me here so 21 years though is the like the time bob lived so remember it was 12 months so flip those numbers 21 years so i became a caregiver at at 32 years old and I I often say it was before I could cook a meatloaf right I didn't I, I oh wasn't really uh, I wasn't in a position of knowledge or or experience and I knew very few people that even knew the word caregiver right right so uh, through the through the years I would go to certain places and ask you know what do you have support for people like me and I found uh, of course this was in the 90s right so I found there wasn't anything and if you were going to figure this out Rich, you had to figure it out by uh, yourself you didn't even have the internet really to oh you did not was... actually they had chat rooms okay that right. remember the beginning of, of oh, yeah, chat rooms yeah. right so I can recall just trying so hard, desperately hard, to find out what is wow. going on here because there were times I thought, you know, is Bob doing this on purpose? Because one minute he seemed fine and sure. and the next minute he, he wasn't. And that's the thing about dementia, right? And so I, I thought... Yeah, I got to find someone to talk to. I remember going into one of those old time chat rooms where you had to log your name and all your right. information and, and gain yep. permission. And I couldn't find anybody on the internet. You know, like cyberspace was empty. So the the worst part, though, is when I finally admitted I could live or die. And uh, and Rich Dine didn't sound so bad. I uh, <laughs> I so, just feel for you. It's 
Well, I, I, I came to find out through my own research mm -hmm. that uh, even though it's a very lonely, lonely spot and you're filled with emotions that are just, you know, uh, you know, guilt and, and sadness and, and, and joy, too. I mean, it wasn't all negative by any means. Sure. But there are so many emotions that I hadn't experienced before this time in my life. Now, Bob and I had two kids, too, so... It was a matter of uh, also going to work as the primary, uh, you know, had a household where Bob had always been, mm -hmm. and then also taking care of the house and, and school and, of course, his medical expenses. And so typically caregivers are financially strapped as well. So it's, it's this emotional strain. It's uh, also a financial strain. It's a social strain. And, you know, here we are. There are, gosh, 50 million caregivers oh. just in the United States. Well, just this, let me throw this stat yeah. out here because I, here you are, you're, you're trying to support a household, raise children, and take care of your husband. That's right. And a lot of people don't realize what a financial strain this is. So this is a stat from 2018, 18.4 18 billion hours of caregiver, free caregiver service valued at $232 billion. Now, there's a little side note on the real estate side, because that's my background. There are some states that are looking at putting an additional homestead tax where part of that money would be able to support some of these caregivers. And nice. I, I think that would be awesome. I mean, you come from that background. I would be, put a mill on me. That's fine. Yeah. Well, what it is, too, though, is... As a caregiver, we refocus, and mm -hmm. the focus is not on ourselves any longer, and this is one of the big areas of concern. Mm -hmm. The average caregiver will skip for uh, their own doctor's appointments on average for five years wow. because the focus is only on the patient. I mean, there's sure. a, a certain amount of I'm okay, you know, my, my husband or, or, you know, my 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 spouse or, or sibling, whoever you're caring for, has been diagnosed. Therefore, they need it more than I do. And and, and so there's a little bit of that. Also, Did you have a little bit of guilt if you took time for yourself to take care bit. of? Oh, yeah. Rich, it's the guilt that kills us. As a matter of fact, there are some areas that say that the stress in caregiving, and in particular for dementia, any one of the dementias, and there are several, mm -hmm. Alzheimer's you mentioned, but it's only one of many, okay. uh, uh, the guilt and the stress is is so severe that often the caregiver will pass away before the patient. Oh my goodness! Because of the level of stress, and right. then you go ahead and say, "Well, I haven't been to the doctor in five years either," so that doesn't help, right? right. The the guilt and it's hard if you've never felt that kind of damaging guilt sure. is. Um, it, it, it's kind of like this. In, before caregiving comes mm -hmm. along, you're entitled to make a mistake. Right. You, know, you can understand it. We say, oh, we're only human. Once you become a caregiver, we measure ourselves against some angelic level right. where if I make a mistake, it's life or death, you know, for my... Sure. For, and um, and on top of that, you have a, a circle of people that will always judge, silently maybe. Yep. But always judge. And Could so have, would have, should have. That's right. Yeah. And uh, and so you're trying to make the whole world happy. Now, mm -hmm. you also mentioned about free caregivers, which is, I think, the uh, same thing as family caregivers. That's right, right. Right. But these are people just like yourself that financially they're giving up because I've worked with a lot of these folks where they're giving up their jobs to go take care of mom right. and dad. They move in and you have other siblings that are out there. And here again, I, I would hate to be in their position because you know, and I don't think there's any malice intent by the other siblings, but I hear a lot of that, well, you know what you need to do. So what I typically say is that there's usually one sibling or or one person that makes the decision and mm -hmm. the rest are there to judge. <laughs> the Right. Let me right. support right. you. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm here, Let, if, I'm I, here you need if you me. need me. Yeah. But I'll be at a concert tonight with my phone off. So right. uh, call me tomorrow. Uh, yeah, that happens. That happens wow. a lot. And also the new face of the caregiver. If you look at, a, you know, I encourage people to 
to Google or, or to ask, look for the, the current U.S. census mm-hmm. to find out what the population is doing right now. You see with the baby boomers, which, of sure. course, we're, you know, I'm right on the cusp there, so I, right. I, I've been included in that group. With the baby, baby boomers maturing right now, and the average age for dementia is 65, mm-hmm. in the next four years, we will have the highest population, and it will continue until 2030 wow. of seniors. Now, with that, it costs money to have the you know the the patient care and so forth. So mm-hmm. you have you're going to have a whole lot more people taking care of their loved one in in their home and trying to figure this out. Uh, and, and we got to make sure there's resources there. And we have to start designing homes to facilitate it. Sure. Because we in America we have not developed a multi generational living system like they have in Europe. So if you have that colonial and all the bedrooms are upstairs, it's kind of hard to have mom or dad move in, especially right. with those. Right. Well, and then you mentioned that people quit their jobs and they go to take on the caregiving. Yeah. Okay, they feel, and I completely understand and respect, this is my job, this is what right. I should do. And so they go in and they take care of. Well, the new face of the caregiver is going to be the millennial very, very, very soon. Mm-hmm. And if you think of these young, this young generation giving up their job, they're right. also giving up their Social Security, they're giving up their standing at their companies, their, yeah. their you know, their career there's um putting off having their families there so it it, it's a lot more than i'm going to take care of my parents because i love them sure they are uh, establishing a new norm for the the millennial and the caregivers that we're going to need to handle this baby boomer till 2030 is the millennial wow so we are really and i even really thought that's some great points we are really on the cusp of something you don't hear about much And it is going to impact us as a nation just dramatically. And I know it's worldwide, but just speaking. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, everyone, my guess is anyone driving on any given street, they Mm -hmm. can see that there are these huge places, senior centers going up, right? So senior living, and and oftentimes it will start out as a retirement villa, and then it can go Independent living. And then independent, and then memory care. Work our way up to memory care, sure. That's right. And then it could, you know, even go into lockdown Alzheimer's units. But but you'll you'll see these, and they're all over where we go. So I think that our world, the U.S., uh, is preparing for this, and that's good. There'll be rooms, but now we have to make sure that can people afford it. That's exactly it, right? And uh, and somebody's got to be doing their homework before they they make these buildings. So I got to believe they they have a uh, an understanding that they'll be able to fill these rooms. But the part that I am concerned with mm-hmm. is where's the care going to come from. Because caregiving okay. by itself, we have people that walk into places and go, oh, yeah, can I have a job here? Sure. And, and they'll say, okay, why, why are you interested in this? And you'll think, well, you know, I can do this because, you know, my grandfather had dementia and I loved him and I took mm-hmm. care of him. And I think, well, that's a good start. That's a great right. start. But being a caregiver for 21 years and, and with dementia, uh, as, you know, Bob's, he had many issues, but dementia was one of them. Uh it's not your grandpa that you're going to be taking care of. And so sure. will you be able to give that compassionate, understanding, personal-centered care to someone that you don't love like grandpa? And uh, in order to do that, I think you need two things. One, you need a heck of a lot of patience. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. And you need to have a good heart. Actually, three things. And a good heart and knowledge. Mm-hmm. Right? I can't tell you it would have been a million-dollar ticket if somebody would have said, hey, Jill, here's a list of things you should try at home with Bob. But there was no list, right? So it was a trial and error and, for the most part, error. (laughs) And so, uh, you know, you mentioned about uh, personal positioning for the caregiver. So that was a book that I published in 2006. And uh, because of the direction that my life was going in and the fact that we were maintaining and I don't know how exactly we were maintaining but we were I had many people say you should write some stuff down right well depression is hand in hand hand in hand with caregivers Mm -hmm. in particular dementia again and I found myself going into that you know I want to be normal I want to have a normal life I want to laugh again because you you were just in your 30s at that point yep 
uh, you know, I, I want to, but I couldn't. I was I was restricted by, by so many things and guilt being the number one. Oh, sure. If you right? laugh or have a moment of having fun, yeah. just I'm sure that guilt was like you a You don't blanket. feel entitled to that. Right. You just don't. Oh, my goodness. So, but what happened was mm-hmm. when I said that I could live or die and dying didn't sound so bad, I realized just how low I was. Right. And if I was going to do something, I had to figure it out by myself. And I started with nothing more than a pad of sticky notes. And every time I would think, oh, I feel good, or right this minute the burden is lifted, I would think, well, what did I do to get here? And I started writing these things down, and eventually I just had oodles and oodles of these yellow sticky notes. Eventually I did put them together. I collected them, put them together in personal positioning for the caregiver to say, you have to make yourself a survival plan. So Mm -hmm. I teach caregiver survival. That's been something I've done for 14 years now. And the, the whole idea is, number one, we must take care of ourselves because right. I, the family needed me. I, I, I didn't have a right to go down. I didn't. I had to take care of myself, right? Children and, sure. and, and of course, Bob's care and so forth, uh, ha- hanging on to my job. And so creating this plan of making sure I was okay became forefront. So it's the airplane oxygen. It is the oxygen on the airplane, absolutely. Yeah, Yeah. they know what they're talking about. Put your own mask on first before you can help anyone else. And that's what personal positioning for the caregiver. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's it's an easy read. The whole I never wanted it to be over one hour because people have to reread it. Right. Right. Because if there's a chapter there on, you know, what what do I do? I'm losing my friends. And that's a big part of caregiving. You lose your friends. Right. Now, you might think friends, well, they should come and support you and surround you. But think of how difficult it would be to be a friend of someone who is caregiving for someone with many, 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 many issues. If I were a friend and I was going to go to you, Rich, and ask you if you wanted to go bowling on Friday night, there's a voice inside of me that says, I shouldn't ask him to go bowling on Friday night. My gosh, he's going to think I'm so insensitive. He's got so many things going on. I'm just going to wait for Rich to call me when he's ready. And that's where it lies. So it's not like your friends leave you. It's just they're trying to be respectful. That's right. On Mm. the flip side, the way a caregiver interprets is where did everybody go? Sure. No one wants to be around me. I don't have any friends. I don't financially have the status I used to. My partner, Certainly. if it's a spouse, you know, uh, you know, is is uh, is important. But you know, so I should stay by them. The guilt, like you had mentioned, to not have fun also plays an issue. So you know, in the book, it's it's intended to say, look, we can change this, but it's us, the caregiver. On top of everything else we have to do, we have to bring ourselves to a certain level of being accepted by others and in entitling ourselves right. to having some fun. And, yes, going bowling or whatever. Uh, we, we should. So, and, and cognitively, I can see people coming to that and saying, yes, this makes sense, the oxygen. But emotionally coming to that, that's just got to be a journey that is incredibly challenging. And how do you guide people? Along that route. So first of all, we have to talk about it. That's the first thing. Okay. Because caregivers are silent, right? I mean, we are silent. It is a catch-22. Because if I complain about it, right, right people are going to think I'm weak. Mm-hmm. But And I don't want to look weak. And, and certainly there's enough negativity in my world that I don't need to complain about it. And I don't want people to be afraid to approach me. So sure. much of this is, number one, talking about it to people to say, listen, I recognize that my life is complicated. You mm-hmm. know, I used to tell the kids, you know, this is not exactly how normal people live <laughs> if you want normal you should probably check out the neighbor's house because <laughs> because it's not normal right. you know it's not the way that we had it's fun it's it's wonderful we had you know we have a wonderfully loving family but it's not normal and so i think talking about your care and the amount of time you're putting in and um, allows you to free up some of those interpersonal emotions that we mm-hmm. that we hang on to. So, uh, letting people know if you need something. Now, people, have, you know, we have a hard time asking for help. Right. Uh, and one of the reasons is because we're we don't want any emotional debt. Right. If you come up and say, Jill, let me help you do this. My mind in a caregiver, even to this day, and Bob passed in 2012, even to this day, I will think, what will I owe you if you help me? Because I'm already in debt up to my ears. I don't need any emotional debt on top of it. (laughs) Right. I can see that. 
So you don't. You you know, I can do it by myself. And our favorite word is fine. I'm fine. Right. You're doing okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Good. Yeah, I'm fine. Good. But and, and really we're struggling. So one of the greatest pleasures I have mm-hmm. when you say am I passionate about this? I I can't tell you how passionate I am because to stand before people to say, I know that this is what you're feeling, and allowing them the freedom to go, yes, that's me. You understand. <laughs> yes, somebody understands. And uh, and so, you know, that's what uh, personal position for the caregiver allows is mm-hmm. to say there are people that are just like you out there. You're not alone because it's a very lonely right. spot to be in. And um, so – Anyway, that was uh, kind of the way life happened. Certainly didn't plan it. My yellow sticky notes just <laughs> all found themselves in a publisher's house. Now, for those millennials, that is not writing something on your phone. That's <laughs> yeah. That's how I like to say my yeah my original 1965 Palm Pilot. Jot things down. Right. So as you're going through this now, and let's step back just a little bit, because you've developed not only a passion for this, but a whole company. That's right. Wrapped around. Tell us a little bit about the company and the services you offer. Then we'll go a little bit more on maybe some things that potential caregivers or even friends of caregivers and how to best help. Terrific. Tell us a little bit about your company. Okay. So Global Training Experts, uh, I actually opened that uh, in 2008. Mm Mm-hmm. And initially, because I had worked for Chrysler and I've been a corporate trainer for 25 years, I opened it because I took a buyout at Chrysler and I thought, well, I can continue doing my automotive management Mm -hmm. type jobs. But the funny thing is, is personal positioning uh, was out and I kept getting calls to do events for personal positioning for caregivers and caregiver survival and and even the Catholic Church came and asked, you know, can you do some events for us to help us? And so automotive and, and that didn't was from the book. Well, or? it was the concept of the book of staying mentally healthy. Okay. But and I mean that's how they found out that's about right. you. That's right. Okay. That's okay. right. Okay. And so they uh, so all of a sudden all these automotive classes, there was no no one calling on those. <laughs> it was <laughs> it was just the caregiver survival and, and so forth. So knowing that people can't be great at everything, I thought, I I just want to go where my heart is. And so I went to the, uh, you know, staying with dementia care and caregiving survival and, and, you know, making sure I had the support in place for caregivers. Well, that uh, about five years ago, I thought I got to take this a step further Mm -hmm. because Bob was actually in six different facilities. Wow. And he got kicked out of five. And when we have, uh, when we make that choice to put our loved ones in a facility, it's extremely difficult. Uh, The torment in your head that says, I'm going to try every single thing I can before I I do that. It's just like how many buckets of guilt can be self imposed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then propped up by your sphere that doesn't quite understand what's going on. Well, and in, in you, you have to kind of play the movie in your head that you take this person that you love with all your heart. Right. And you walk into a facility and you have to admit there, I couldn't do it at home. Right? Absolutely. And and we couldn't do it at home. Nor would he want you Nor to. Nor would he want to. And he willingly went in there. Yes. And, of course, that's all part of the seminar to tell you exactly how that all went. But okay. but the, the, the point of that is to make the decision of where to what, – what place is good enough. Right. And what place is perfect? Because you're looking for perfect. Remember, we're, we're still measuring on that angelic level. Sure. And so I'm looking for the perfect place. Well, all I wanted to hear is that perfect didn't exist. And that is something I say all the time, mm-hmm. is that perfect was 10 years ago. Perfect yeah. doesn't exist right now. So let me find the second perfect place, <laughs> right? Show me the second best place right. Right. that my loved one is going to be safe here, right? And you will take care of them and you will know what to do. Well, I mentioned Bob got kicked out. Mm -hmm. And because dementia is this gray area and you have, I mean, you could ask, you know, nurses and and medical professionals and doctors and so forth, how long did you study dementia? And unless that's their primary focus, they don't remember if they did in school. Well, you know, just a little side note, like I had mentioned too, that I did go through an Alzheimer's training and it was just a general training. It wasn't in depth or anything. But my concept, and, you know, I'm not the brightest ball, but I'm pretty smart. I figured 
I thought Alzheimer's, and I know that's just one part, one type of dementia, but I thought it was just the synapses and the brains were misfiring, that the signal wasn't getting delivered. And when I went into this class and they showed me the cross sections of the brain and it looked like Swiss cheese, that it wasn't misfiring, it was that the brain had been eaten away. It, it's just a whole different paradigm shift. And I, I think you're right, we're even, you're talking doctors, but I'm, the general populace really has a misunderstanding that it's, this information is just not out there to them. And so I can totally understand what you're saying. So, and so let, let's talk about that because you're right. First of all, we have to understand what this is. Mm -hmm. So I remember when I was first trying to find a place for Bob. And I sat down at the kitchen table, and back then it was the yellow pages. There was no <laughs> Google, right? right? right, right. So, and, and, I'm, and I'm calling, and I'm saying, my husband has Alzheimer's. And the person on the other end would say, how do you know? And I said, because I diagnosed him this morning. Oh, <laughs> right? I thought, this has got to be it, this sure. behavior, right? And, and I had a real hard time grasping, you know, how this whole puzzle goes together. So if you were to take an umbrella, mm -hmm. and you were to put a the name dementia on the umbrella. Okay. Every spoke of the umbrella is a different type of dementia. Okay. Right? So you have Lewy body dementia, you have frontal lobe dementia, you have Alzheimer's dementia. The reason why we hear so much about Alzheimer's is that it is the biggest category. So two thirds of dementias are Alzheimer's. Okay. But there are all these other dementias. There's even mixed dementia. Now, what's that? I'm not familiar with it's that. It's more than one type. Oh, I see. Right? Oh, wow. Now, now here's the thing. We, it doesn't matter to me what type of dementia. Sure. Even when I teach, I say, does it matter? No. Many people never get diagnosed. Bob was never diagnosed. He never had a D in his file, right? Because he had brain tumor, and he had that. So mm -hmm. they're like, oh, no, this isn't dementia. But dementia is a series of inabilities, right? It, sure. So, but... If I were to sit here and say, oh, yes, he had frontal lobe because he had a stroke there, well, I'm maybe pulling your leg there because I don't know for sure he did. He was never diagnosed with right. that. Um, and a yet, lot of these diagnoses can't happen until after the person passes away. Only Alzheimer's. Only Alzheimer's. Only Alzheimer's. Now, there are certain levels of dementia, okay. right? And there's also normal aging. So right. normal aging is fun. People that are going through normal aging, and I'm in that category, Heck right? Yeah. I We can take shortcuts like nobody's business. I can look at you and I say, hey, Rich, guess who I saw yesterday? You know that girl with the red hair? You know what I'm talking about, right? And she had on that, that, uh, oh, that, yeah. uh, that thing, right? Yeah. I and am that, right there with you. Exactly. And we have a whole conversation and we don't even have the specifics. And that's the benefit of normal aging. I tell my 14 year old daughter all the time that every day that passes, I get to mess with her more and more. And we have a very close relationship. I go, I can't wait till I'm 65. As soon as my ARP card came, it gave me permission to act a little goofy Absolutely. around her friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it just increases. Yeah. So yeah. I've, I've trained her that you just have to deal with the kid. That's it. <laughs> so. so normal aging is great. And then, but some people go beyond normal aging, right? right? And you can go on into the, that first level of, of dementia. Now, even at that level, you can still function. You can still drive. You can still work. You mm -hmm. still, right? And, and many people stay there for years and years and years and forever. Many people pass that. That second stage of dementia is very difficult. This is that decision making. People would uh, be able to relate to it if I said this is the stage that they ask questions all the time. Are we almost there? Are we there yet? Are we almost there? Are we there yet? And as a family caregiver, mm -hmm. the one thing I say is you have got to beg for patience because that's that area where you can't turn and go, stop saying that. They right. didn't know they said it the first time. So right. for us to say that's not fair, but that's what we resort to when, you know, we, we sure. just get fed up. I can remember <laughs> I can remember at this stage, I would wake up in the morning and I would say a prayer and I'd say, dear Lord, yesterday I didn't do so well in that patience category. I hope today you'll make me stronger. And I, I, today is going to be the day I can just feel it. I had a good night's sleep. Today's the day I'd go out and I'd be in that kitchen for five minutes. I'd turn around back in the bedroom on my knees going, okay, maybe tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> right? You right. have all good intentions. Sure. Uh, but 
it's the stage two is very very difficult and so w the families need to make a plan right there mm -hmm. because by stage three is where you often have uh, areas of hallucinations and wandering and, and, and extreme forgetfulness and so forth and you don't want to have on top of all that to have to sit down and now start make decisions so if the family does the family meeting if there is such a thing or even if it's one person that has to do research and I highly suggest you do research research mm -hmm. to find out what is this and what are my plans you know plan a keep them home now keep them home sounds like a great idea if you can do it safely and if right. all parties can be healthy doing it i uh, i have to tell you i went through that uh, where i have to do everything possible and i hired a, a lady an, an older woman mm -hmm. um I, I would have to say she probably close to 70 and she lived on a farm and uh and her name was miss kitty <laughs> so i mean is that now perfect right? right and kitty was uh what i was going to say you know my 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 answer to prayer she came in and she was going to take care of bob because he no longer could be by himself and uh, the only thing she had to do was take care of him. And I thought, well, if I could sure. do this, then, you know, I don't have to put him in a facility. I can keep him home. I can go to work. And by this time, I was working two jobs because the expenses and, and so forth. And so, but, uh, you know, 5 o'clock came, and, and her son picked her up, so it was time. But I, I, we had her, I don't know, three, four months, I suppose, and Bob's behavior started changing uh, considerably. His night and days were mixed up, which is very common with, the mm -hmm. dementias, right? Many of the dementias, we get them mixed up. <coughs> but you got to remember, my kids are now in high school at that point, and right. I have to go to work. So we would take shifts, four-hour shifts. So uh, everybody would get some sleep. Not enough sleep, but some right. sleep. Because, uh, you know, their dad or, or Bob was up at night. And um, ultimately what we found out is that she was actually dosing him with um, Ativan uh, during the day. So, so he had that's sleep. why he was up all night, right? It, it, she actually turned. So even though it sounds like, boy, I can hire the mm -hmm. lady down the street and get away with this, or um, what we know is that, you know, it, that's hard to do. Yeah. Let me ask you a question, though. then. Because you have teenagers, and they were involved in the process. How yeah. was it on them? Yeah. And how did you deal with that? So uh, so I, uh, so I, let me tell you one story, and let me oh, yeah. answer that For because sure. it's going to feed in well. So also another thing. I got oodles and oodles. <laughs> Too bad this is only an hour, right? Right. Uh, but another thing that we have, which is the human behavior, is to mimic, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we, we mimic if... You go to the grocery store, Absolutely. somebody says hi, you automatically, you know, typically say hi and without too much thought. So our, our human behavior allows us to mimic and encourages us mm -hmm. to mimic. And in a caregiving situation, we can start mimicking our patients, too. Right? That is a natural ability, and there's no mm -hmm. reason to think that it stops when you become a caregiver. Right. So... Uh, early on, about 94, I started to think, because cancer was in our life all the time with Bob's lung cancers right. and, and brain cancer. So naturally, every pain I had was cancer. You know, cancer of the knee, the elbow, the <laughs> neck. You know, it didn't matter. Oh, sure. I had cancer of everything. But then... Cancer uh, of the mosquito bite. Uh, there was nothing that wasn't cancer right. for me. Oh. And it was always around the corner. Uh, and I remember that... Um, that uh, reading about um, lymphoma. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jackie Onassis had been diagnosed, I believe it was her. Oh. And I'm reading this article and I'm thinking, oh my heavens, I have lymphoma. I get dizzy, I get nauseous, I, you know, this and this and this. And I'm thinking, well, this is just the craziest thing because you know, I'm probably going to now die before Bob. And, and of course, back then we didn't know how long he was going to live. His life expectancy was 12 months. And right. By that time, it had been three years, I think. And so I went to the doctor, sure, that I had lymphoma, and said to the doctor, you know, maybe you can cut me a deal. I've already diagnosed myself. I just need to know, like, how much time do I have? I have sure. a lot of things to get in order. Anyway, come to find out I was pregnant. So here we go. I said, boy, lymphoma and, and pregnancy, we <laughs> got a lot wow. in common, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when you said I had teenagers, and I not only had teenagers, I also... Bob was supposed to never be able to reproduce, right, with all the extreme right. chemo and radiation. And, and, you know, we had his ribs removed, his, his nerves removed. I mean, it was just – and 
but you know it, it was one of these miracles so along comes nicholas 10 years after my second son jacob and that's my son's name nicholas is it <laughs> so yeah so now i had a nine-year-old a 10-year-old and a one-year-old oh my goodness so now i'm going to go forth and answer the question how did the kids do miraculous and I say that because we were broke as broke could be, which means that you don't ever have to go out and have fun. You bring it to your own home. So they would bring all their friends over. Our place was the happening place, right, because uh, they would call him Bobby G, which is, you know, uh, Bob Gaffner. So they, you know, come on, uh, Bobby G's here, and, you know, he'll hang with us. So they never minded bringing their dad you know, everywhere. And, and so we had a lot of fun just in our that own is awesome. household. Uh, and dysfunction can be fun if mm-hmm. you, you know, Bob had been a disc jockey when before all this. Oh, wow. So he was a real lively guy and right. never lost his love for music. And uh, so was it hard when he passed? Uh, yeah, it was. It was hard. And even though we had 21 years to prepare ourselves, um, I think... The kids learned so much about compassion, and uh, and I'm so lucky. The schools got involved, too, and that's a big deal. I contacted the schools and said, here's our situation, and I need guidance for them while they're in school because that's a vulnerable you know, many well, years. For sure. So, you know, kids can follow the wrong the wrong group or whatever. They put them in what they called leadership class okay. and so that they wouldn't follow the wrong crowd and um, but here again you took the initiative and reached out to the schools versus waiting to to react oh yeah you were proactive which sounds like during this whole process was really the the paradigm shift and the key difference is being proactive whether it was writing sticky notes or calling the school well you have to yeah. I, I mean, the, the, I'm kind of... Well, you a, have to, but most people don't. Yeah, I, I'm a, a organized... I don't know if I was always organized, <laughs> Rich, or I had to become right. organized. But I did become organized, mm-hmm. and I wanted to make sure because I I had so many things to consider that making sure that Bethany, Jacob, and Nicholas were okay, you sure. know, that was, you know, that was always a big deal. And, and Bob maintained, a, you know, a full-time with them too i mean he was he was always around and then when he moved into his first um home uh the kids started growing up and then it was the college years and and that kind of thing right so um but they always kept in touch with them every monday night was monday night football and that was always at his his locations wherever he was but the kicking out this is another reason why i do what i do um global training experts which i know i'm I'm really going past that. But Global Training That's Experts okay. teaches two classes. Okay. And the first uh, one is Certified Dementia Practitioner. Okay. Now, I am a Certified Alzheimer's Disease and Dementia Care Trainer. The National Council of Certified Dementia Practitioners is the global entity, and I teach their content. Okay. Right? And I'm licensed to teach it anywhere in the United States. But those are for uh, senior care facility professionals. So mm-hmm. it would be an administrator, a social sure. worker, a activity director, an owner. And it, so there are prerequisites for that. Right. But that gives people an advantage because they are now certified in, in that. If I was looking to put Bob in a place today, I would say, show me the certifications of your staff. Show me that they have training. And the CDP is is the only certified program in the country right now. So I just want to see. You've invested in your people, right? Right. Like, I want to see that. So that's the benefit of CDP is let's get all these locations, which tens of thousands, Mm -hmm. right, of locations. Let's make sure that their staff is is educated in this. Right. Now, if you walked into, just going back to that, mm because I think, uh, you know, the whole premise here is teaching baby boomers, right? So if you were to go into that situation now and you were looking for some a place like that, mm-hmm. you would expect uh, 80% of their staff to be certified, 100%, 10 or Well, for right now, what we suggest mm-hmm. is that for, uh, for companies that say, okay, how do I get involved and what right. should I do? I would say at a minimum, one per shift. 
Okay. Right? So we want a set of eyes to help uh, identify where areas of improvement are necessary and to teach others. Eventually, invest in more than that. But initially, one per shift So at at a minimum. That's right. At a minimum. Okay. That's right. All right. And uh, so that would have helped because all the times that he had to be moved was because of his dementia behavior. But, uh, you know, at, at one time they had said, oh, Bob's scaring people because he hallucinated. Oh, I can remember when I sat down mm-hmm. and told them before he actually moved in about hallucinations. The response was, oh, no, we have a lot of people that do that. We know how to handle blah, blah, blah. So, you know what? You're telling me this. You're the professional. Right. This is your location. I'm going to trust that this is the truth. Well, when it started happening, all of a sudden it was like, no, he's scaring others. We have to get him out. Well, he was sent to uh, one hospital, and then they considered him to be out of his mind and sent him to a, um, a psych ward across from Detroit City Airport. And I was actually teaching in Saginaw. And I, by the time I got there, he was drugged and, and kind of tied to a chair. And, uh, and the psychiatrist said, he doesn't belong here, right? He didn't mm-hmm. snap. That's not it. And I said, I know. But no one understands this this disease, right? So right. we didn't. No one knew what to do. So it was very. That confusing. was about what year that that happened? That would have been about two thousand nine. Okay, so not that long ago. No, no, wow. ten years ago. Wow. But the um, so so th- that's what I think about certified dementia practitioner CDP. Right. So I train all over the the country, uh, and and many times companies will say, "Come in and just teach it on my turf." in my location and Mm -hmm. and that's fine too so any support i can give there but there's another category that's even bigger than that and that is the everybody else so there are (laughs) there are uh, professionals that work in senior care industry Mm -hmm. that's one group of people and then there is everybody else and that is roughly 40 million now i i think i could take a bow and arrow and I could shoot this arrow in any direction and I am going to knock over 10 caregivers anywhere I go because everybody knows someone who is a caregiver or is a caregiver or foresees in the very near future that it could happen to them absolutely there's there's no doubt about it even receiving that text like I told you this last Tuesday right and this is a dear friend of mine from college and, you know, she's sending me the text. I knew she was going through it because we've spoken. But they just passed, and it's like she's 50 or 49. Yeah. I mean, very young. Yep. Yeah, and there's no real age. I mean, they say the average age of a caregiver is 49, actually. Oh, but really? But that is what statistics hmm. tell us. But they also say, and, you know, you can only count a statistic if you've, depending on the population that sure. you you know that you've surveyed. However, they also say there's roughly about 44 percent of men that are now caregiving, wow. but it's even harder for men because if they are known as a caregiver in their workforce, it will stall their career. So, and men don't always share. Nothing against men, right? Mm-hmm. I think men are great, but men don't always share their emotional side anyway, right? Not to the level that women do as. As a rule, I oh, know, especially for us that, yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's changed a lot here in the last seven years. But for my generation, and um, no, that's not what you did. Right. You it, know? it stalls. I can tell you so back in 91, so that was the year Bob was diagnosed. Mm-hmm. Um, I lost 11 days of work. Now, that was through everything, that was through the diagnosis of the lung um, cancer and the brain cancer. It was taking half a lung out, that was one surgery, the right side out, that was another surgery. His brain tumor removed, that was another surgery. Wow. I did go to the first couple chemo and, ther- and, and radiation. So all together though, in the whole 1991, I lost 11 days. And on my annual appraisal at the end of the year, mm-hmm. it said, Jill is an excellent employee if it weren't for those uh, the excessive amount of time off. Now, 11 days, and of course, at that point, when I was reading that, I also mm-hmm. knew that Bob's life expectancy was only 12 months. So, right. you know, I, I, I was trying to react to everything, hold the family together, the job together, him together, medical together. Not myself, because I wasn't giving myself much <laughs> right. at that point, right? Right. Not that. But, and, and I look at that, and then that goes into someone's mm-hmm. employee history or their Forever. PHR or yep. goes into their, their uh, HR file. 
So now it comes time for promotions. Where do they go? The HR file. And they pull it out and they read it and they go, oh, that's too bad. She's, you know, she's really well-educated, but, whoa, she's a troublemaker. Look, she's got excessive time off. That's right. So what I learned to do is keep my mouth shut. Now, lucky me, I had a gentleman who picked up the phone and called and said, I'm looking at your PHR, and I think you would be an asset to the department. Can you explain the excessive time off? And I told him, I lost 11 days for, and just like I told you, right. you know, the two-minute version. And he said, and you only lost 11 days. Uh, that was my thought. Yeah. So, you know, it's perception. And if you haven't worn the shoes, maybe it's easier to judge. But mm-hmm. So I was able to move ahead, thank goodness. But when we look at men in caregiver positions, this is what happens to them as well. And they're smart enough to know, hey, I can, you know, I can kind of just overlook right. this. I'm not going to tell everybody because, you know, the, the, the promotions that I could get or, or whatever, uh, you know, would be, would be stopped or at least slowed down if they know that I have this. And many times employers would say, well, you know what, he's handling enough. Right. Uh, let's let's go ahead and give it, you know, to, to Pete this time, and we'll we'll see. Maybe next time things won't be such a burden in his life. He'll be fine. So so we hide it at that point too. So right. you, you see how that inside just yeah. keeps turning and turning. So uh, when we say that we are an emotional rack, <laughs> it's because all this stuff is inside, um, and uh, and so that's why for for me to go to large companies or small companies i don't care what size Mm -hmm. and say let me take a moment let me give me one hour with your workforce let me help your caregivers because i'm sure at least 40 percent of your population is caring for someone right now and they're not saying a word about it so you know while you're teaching them to eat healthy and while you're teaching them all these great things that hr departments do let's go ahead and bring up the caregiver part and have and and we you know we can acknowledge it and, uh, and give them some help and some guidelines. Yeah, that would be great. Oh, that would be <laughs> right. a huge impact change. And quite frankly, for a corporation that had that type of scenario in place, think of the talent you could draw. It's such a value-added service. And actually having that we care about our employees, yeah. that it's going to pay dividends for them for times to come. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Even going into schools, uh, I was with one of my neighbors over the weekend who um, works at a high school. And I mentioned to him as a principal, I said, this is something you may want to think of. Because remember, we got kids in high school and now their grandparents are kind of going through this maybe. Sure. And so they start staying away because they think grandma and grandpa, they're not making much sense anymore. And if we could get in and just explain, this is what's going on with grandma and grandpa. And this is how you can help your grandparents. Or if they watch their parents go through the caregiving stages and mm-hmm. they see their parents go through some depression, this is what they can understand. And, you know, let's just open the subject up since we know that from now until 2030 this is such a huge never seen before time right. uh, there's no reason that we shouldn't bring this up at every stage right and how do you feel about people getting a uh, long-term care insurance at age 60 <laughs> Well, I mean, I think long-term care, I, I can't say that if I wasn't living my life that I would understand it. Right. Uh, I, you know, on the first day of employment, people bring it up, and you don't really hear much about it after that. Ever again. Right? right. Oh, that is my mistake. We are still going Okay. Here. <laughs> uh, I thought maybe you were just going to say, Jill, you're talking too much. <laughs> no, no, no. Time's up. No, nope. no, we're good. <laughs> but, no, long-term care is great. You just never know when you need it. It's kind of the same thing sure. about... We don't plan to lose our memory. Right. And, you know, uh, the, the stories that I hear of people that, um, you know, never really gained information from their loved ones before their loved ones forgot what it well, was altogether. Do you know, that's one of the things we share with our clients a lot because we do deal with a lot of the adult children. And we tell them, hey, you know how your mom and or dad's told you that story 50 times? Audio record it. Save it down. Enjoy that moment. And I think part of being a caregiver is you are so worried about doing things right, and you do have so much guilt, and you're tired, and you're wore out, that you do have limited time. You can't enjoy the moments where that really needs to be the focus versus worrying about tomorrow and what's going to happen next week and next month. Let's worry about today and have one good memory come out of today. I think that's a great idea. 
Sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that we can do. We can make a diary, a, a log, you know, of some of the things. Mm -hmm. uh, and we should. Uh, there's such a thing called person-centered care. And uh, person-centered care for someone with any of the dementias means when right. you find something that works, write it down. Yeah. When you have an issue, write it down. Share that information so the next person that is there can learn right. from it. Because as the saying goes, when you have met a person with dementia, you've only met one. Right. Because no They're, two are alike. So even if you're planning on having someone come in and help you, by just having that diary where you could say, mm -hmm. hey, just take a moment, review this, that's probably going to make be a pretty big game changer for them, wouldn't it? The person coming in to assist? As long as they know what to do with it. Right. So you have to know what to do with a care plan. If you don't understand the benefits mm -hmm. of a care plan. So I would say for myself, of course, I'm going to say – Go and take a class. Get, well, I, get some knowledge. Find out what is a care plan and what do I do with a care plan? What's yeah. the benefit of this care plan? Let me know plan? when your next class is. I'll come. <laughs> oh, seriously. That's seriously. Terrific. I think it's – I, I'm a big believer in getting educated on things. Um, that's why I went to that Alzheimer's class. And here again, I walked away a smidgen more. That's right. Understanding. Yeah, just yeah. a smidgen. Yeah. Enough where I've shared that little story about the cross sections because people – they get frustrated. Why are just like you said at the very beginning? Oh my gosh, he was fine ten minutes ago. Now he's doing this. That's right. he's, it's almost like he's out to get me. Yeah. No, no, he's not. Mm -hmm. And even my friends here that I've been speaking with lately, you know, they you find some humor, and then it's oh my, they're they're being vindictive. But having that education, be able to switch your mind. Mm -hmm. oh, what type of? Tell us a little bit because we only have a little bit of time left. Okay, so everyone listening to this will pretend. 1.2 billion people. <laughs> or more. Or more. Oh, there's another one. <laughs> um, how would they get a hold of you and well, take these this wonderful class? Sure. So uh, actually, I'm easy to find. If you were just to Google my name, Jill Gaffney. Yes, you pop right? up. You're like I, me. I pop up. You can't, yeah. And we will never be part of the witness relocation program. <laughs> Forget it. I obviously have no secrets. That's so <laughs> Jill Gaffner, uh, just put that in Google. It'll come up. My company is Global Training Experts. You could look up Global Training Experts. My phone number is 586-419-6073. And someone recently asked me, what are your working hours? And I said, I've just never established any. <laughs> because I, I just feel like this is, you know, they say if you do what you love, it's not called work. So mm -hmm. I, I have to believe that, you know, that's kind of what it is. Um, and then there's just one more message I want to get out that I think is important to your viewers. And that is that um, when caregiving ends, there isn't a structured handbook for that. Really? There isn't, but there are statistics, and they're important. When we stop our caregiving, um, and uh, and mine ended in 2012, mm -hmm. which is when Bob passed, uh, there are statistics that say that depression will follow us for three years. Wow. And it's extremely important that we recognize that sure. because when we're making the survival plan, which is what we put together in class for us anyway, mm -hmm. that has to stay structured for three more years because those years are the ones that we go through and go, did I do this right? Should I have done something else? Mm -hmm. but I, and, and you don't want to get lost in the, all that, right? So while you're caregiving, and three years after, keep an eye on yourself. That's amazing. And I could see myself doing that. Yeah, I do Playing too. back. You know, I have to tell you, one of my favorite sayings in life, and uh, my kids would tell you this in a heartbeat, it's the trials and tribulations of life. That's like the fire that tempers the steel. You know, God never yeah. promised us an easy ride. And it's those trials that makes us as a strong person. Just what you've been through, I've got to tell you, you're just an amazing yeah, person and just the strength. And to be able to really, destiny came knocking on the door, and it takes a strong person to open it. Well, um, I appreciate you saying that. Uh, there was a time that I thought I couldn't do it. and uh, and uh, then Really? Yeah, I just say thought it God so. had the wrong person because they say, you know, sure. you will only give you what you can hold and handle. And uh, But here I am so many years later, and I have the opportunity to meet thousands and thousands of people and help them every year. So oh, I guess impact. God didn't knew what he was doing, yeah. and um, and I feel good about it. And, it, you know, it's uh, I'll never give it up. And how are your kids now as Terrific. far as just? They're good. 
Uh, I have five grandkids, and it's wow. been tough as they have kids. That, you know, um, I think memory of their dad, like, Dad would have loved this. You oh, know, of that course. kind of stuff, yeah. right? But overall, they are remarkable, and uh, and they grow into their father. I don't know how that works. <laughs> that, you know, we start out looking like one, and we right. end up looking like the other, and, and the character. Of, so it's nice. Uh, we're a... Uh, we're a close family, so That's so I'm I'm thrilled. I'm also on Facebook, also. So if somebody looks it up, I know we have a lot of Facebook people. So Global Training Experts is on Facebook. Yeah, and they'll if they are, if you're watching the video, you'll have seen this about 42 times for contact information, or you can reach oh, okay. out to Good. Rich at RichSparks.com, the Rich Sparks team, or Time to Downsize. And going back to just what you were saying about your grandkids, though, mm-hmm. I cannot urge people enough to take a moment at that first stage. Shoot some videos, yep. have those conversations, because we know inevitably when someone's in that situation and they're, you're told 12 months and like my father-in-law was told 12 months and he lived another over a decade. But to have that hindsight to go back and say, hey, what would you say to your grandkid? Yep. And just have a few of those little things to share or some of those funny stories that came about. Do you remember when all those kids were over and, Dad, you were hooked up to all this and you wanted to jam to the Beatles? Yeah. Just those little Well, memories. actually, if we had another three hours, yeah. I would <laughs> fill you with great stories. Oh, that's of awesome. That. So, uh, you know, we have, we, we, had, um, we have a lot of great fun. And, and even in class, there's a lot of humor in, in the class, too. So we're, we add a little mix, things that were so um hard before uh, we can make light of them now of yeah. course we were yeah. the picture of dysfunction there is no <laughs> doubt about it so i might as well brag about it right right heck yeah. Yeah. yeah well that is fantastic and so basically just to recap real quick if you are going out because we're going to give a couple of quick tips we've got just literally two minutes so if you're going out looking for a facility ask that question again if I'm looking for a facility, I would want to know what is the education level? How are your people trained? Are they trained? Don't sit just with a salesperson that's filling beds. Actually right. talk to the people, the caregivers, to say what are your, uh, what's your mm-hmm. education level. Is there a da- national database of um, that certification that someone could look into? Because quite frankly, you could go into a place and say, yeah, we're trained. Heck yeah. No, nope, they would have to show you a certificate. Right, because trained in... What was it again? CDP, Certified Dementia Practitioner. CDP, and that's, that's right. the key because yeah. they could say they're trained. Yeah. yeah, and they could. There's a lot of other people that train. There's no doubt about it. I right. just want to see it. Show me you know what this. Oh, is. what I'm saying is, that yeah. they could just say, "Oh, yeah, we do in-house training," and not yeah. through the CDP program. Sure. And I think that's the key is having that national program that actually regulates the information. That's what I like to think. Yeah, that's right. Well, thank you so much for coming. My pleasure. On. For Baby Boomer University, I hope you enjoyed this hour, and I totally agree. We could spend another three hours, but then we'd have to get out margaritas. (laughs) All (laughs) right. Class is dismissed. All right. Nice job. Thank you. Good question.